and that's the growing process, and it's quite different from the making process. And so there is, for that reason, a fundamental difference between the made and the maker. And this image, this ceramic model of the universe, originated in cultures where the form of government was monarchical. And where, therefore, the maker of the universe was conceived also at the same time in the image of the king of the universe. King of kings, lord of lords, the only ruler of princes, who dost from thy throne behold all dwellers upon earth. I'm quoting the Book of Common Prayer. And so all those people who are oriented to the universe in that way feel related to basic reality as a subject to a king. And so they are on very, very humble terms in relation to whatever it is that works all this thing. I find it odd in the United States that people who are citizens of a republic have a monarchical theory of the universe. Because we are carrying over from the very ancient Near Eastern cultures the notion that the Lord of the universe must be respected in a certain way. People kneel, people bow, people prostrate themselves. Because, the, and you know what the reason for all that is, that nobody is more frightened of everybody else than a tyrant. He sits with his back to the wall and his guards on either side of him. And he has you face downwards on the ground because you can't use weapons that way. When you come into his presence, you don't stand up and face him because you might attack. And he has reason to fear that you might because he's ruling you all. And the man who rules you all is the biggest crook in the bunch because he's the one who succeeded in crime. The other people are pushed aside because they, the criminals, the people we lock up in jail, are simply the people who, who didn't make it. <laughs> so naturally, uh, the real boss sits with his back to the wall and his henchmen on either side of him. And so when you design a church, what does it look like? Catholic church with the altar as it used to be, it's changing now because the Catholic religion is changing. But the Catholic Church has the altar with its back to the wall at the east end of the church. And uh, there, uh, the altar is the throne and the priest is the chief vizier of the court and he is making obeisance to the throne in front, but there is the throne of God, the altar. And uh, all the people are facing it and kneeling down. <coughs> and a great Catholic cathedral is called a basilica, from the Greek basilius, which means king. So a basilica is the house of a king. And the ritual of the Catholic Church is based on the court rituals of Byzantium. A Protestant church is a little different, but basically the same. The furniture of a Protestant church is based on a judicial courthouse. The pulpit. The judge in an American court wears a black robe. He wears exactly the same dress as a Protestant minister. And everybody sits in these boxes. Like there's a jury box, there's a box for the judge, there's a box for this, a box for that. And those are the pews in an ordinary kind of colonial type Protestant church. So both these uh, kinds of churches, which have an autocratic view of the nature of the universe, decorate themselves are architecturally constructed in accordance with political images of the universe. One is the king and the other is the judge, your honor. There's sense in this. Uh, when in court you have to refer to the judge as your honor, it stops the people engaged in litigation from losing their tempers and getting rude. There's, there's a certain sense to that. But when you want to apply that image to the universe itself, to the very nature of life, it has limitations. For one thing, 
the idea of a difference between matter and spirit. This idea doesn't work anymore. Long, long ago, physicists stopped asking the question, what is matter? They began that way. They wanted to know what is the fundamental substance of the world. And the more they asked that question, the more they realized they couldn't answer it. Because if you're going to say what matter is, you've got to describe it in terms of behavior. And that is to say in terms of form, in terms of pattern. You tell what it does. You describe the smallest shapes of it that you can see. Atoms, electrons, protons, mesons, all sorts of sub-nuclear particles. But you never, never arrive at the basic stuff. Because there isn't any. What happens is this. Stuff is a word for the world as it looks when our eyes are out of focus. Fuzzy. Stuff, the idea of stuff is that it's undifferentiated as some kind of a goo. Hmm? And when your eyes are not in sharp focus, everything looks fuzzy. When you get your eyes into focus, you see a form, you see a pattern. And so all that we can talk about is patterns. So the picture of the world in the most sophisticated physics of today is not formed stuff, potted clay, but pattern. A self-moving, self-designing pattern, a dance. And we haven't yet, our common sense as individuals hasn't yet caught up with this. Well now, in the course of time, in the evolution of Western thought, the ceramic image of the world ran into trouble and changed into what I call the fully automatic model or image of the world. In other words, Western science was based on the idea that there are laws of nature. And it got that idea from Judaism and Christianity and Islam. That, in other words, the potter, the maker of the world in the beginning of things, laid down the laws. And the, the law of God, which is also the law of nature, is called the Logos. And uh, in Christianity, the Logos is the second person of the Trinity, incarnate as Jesus Christ, who thereby is the perfect exemplar of the divine law. So we have tended to think of all natural phenomena as responding to laws, as if, in other words, the laws of the world were like the rails on which a streetcar or a tram or a train runs. And these things exist in a certain way, and all events respond to these laws. You know that limerick, there was a young man who said, damn, for it certainly seems that I am a creature that moves in determinate grooves. I'm not even a bus, I'm a tram. <laughs> so, here's this idea that there's a kind of a plan, and everything responds and obeys that plan. Well, in the 18th century, Western intellectuals began to suspect this idea. And what they suspected is whether there is a lawmaker, whether there is an architect of the universe. And they found out, or they reasoned, that you don't have to suppose that there is. Why? Because the hypothesis of God does not help us to make any predictions. In other words, let's put it this way. If the business of science is to make predictions about what's going to happen, science is essentially prophecy. 
What's going to happen? By studying the behavior of the past and describing it carefully, we can make predictions about what's going to happen in the future. That's really the whole of science. And to do this and to make successful predictions, you do not need God as a hypothesis because it makes no difference to anything. If you say everything is controlled by God, everything is governed by God, that doesn't make any difference to your prediction of what's going to happen. And so what they did was simply drop that hypothesis. But they kept the hypothesis of law. Because if you can predict, if you can study the past and describe how things have behaved, and you've got some regularities in the behavior of the universe, you call that law. Although it may not be law in the ordinary sense of the word, it's simply regularity. And so they, what they did was they got rid of the lawmaker and kept the law. And so they conceived the universe in terms of a mechanism. Something, in other words, that is functioning according to regular clock-like mechanical principles. Newton's whole image of the world is based on billiards. The atoms are billiard balls and they bang each other around. And so your behavior, you, every, every individual therefore is defined as a very, very complex arrangement of billiard balls being banged around by everything else. And so behind the fully automatic model of the universe is the notion that reality itself is, to use the favorite term of 19th century scientists, blind energy. In, say, the metaphysics of Ernst Haeckel and T.H. Huxley, the world is basically nothing but blind, unintelligent force. And likewise, in parallel to this, in the philosophy of Freud, the basic psychological energy is libido, which is blind lust. And it is only a fluke, it is only as a result of uh, pure chances that resulting from the exuberance of this energy, there are people with values, with reason, with languages, with cultures, and with love. Just a fluke. Like, you know, one thousand monkeys typing one thousand typewriters for a million years will eventually type the Encyclopedia Britannica. And of course, the moment they stop typing the Encyclopedia Britannica, they will relapse into nonsense. And so in order that that shall not happen, because you and I are flukes in this cosmos, and we like our way of life, we like being human, if we want to keep it, say these people, we've got to fight nature because it'll turn us back into nonsense the moment we let it. And so we've got to impose our will upon this world as if we were something completely alien to it from outside. And so we get a culture based on the idea of the war between man and nature. And we talk about the conquest of space, the conquest of Everest, and the great symbols of our culture are the rocket and the bulldozer. The rocket, you know, compensation for the sexually inadequate male. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 so we're going to conquer space. You know, we're in space already, way out. If anybody cared to be sensitive and let what's outside space come to you, you can if your eyes are clear enough aided by telescopes, aided by uh, radio astronomy, aided by all the kind of sensitive instruments we can devise. We are as far out in space as we're ever going to get. But, you know, sensitivity isn't the pitch. In, in especially in the WASP culture of the United States, we define manliness in terms of aggression. You see, because we are not, we're a little bit frightened as to whether we are really men. And so we put on this great show of being a tough guy. Uh, it was completely unnecessary. Uh, it, it, you know, if you have what it takes, you don't need to put on that show. 
You don't need to beat nature into submission. Why be hostile to nature? Because after all, you are a symptom of nature. You, as a human being, you grow out of this physical universe in just exactly the same way that an apple grows off an apple tree. So let's say the tree which grows apples is a tree with apples, using apple as a verb. And a world in which human beings arrive is a world that peoples. And so the existence of people is symptomatic of the kind of universe we live in. Just as spots on somebody's skin are symptomatic of chickenpox. But we have been brought up by reason of our two great myths, the ceramic and the fully automatic. Not to feel that we belong in the world. So our popular speech reflects it. We say, I came into this world. You didn't, you came out of it. We say, face facts. We talk about encounters with reality. As if it was a head-on meeting of completely alien agencies. And the average person has the sensation that he is a somewhat that exists inside a bag of skin a center of consciousness, which looks out at this thing and what the hell's it gonna do to me, you see? Uh, I recognize you, you kind of look like me and uh, I've seen myself in a mirror and uh, y you look like you might be people. <laughs> so maybe you're intelligent, maybe you can love too. And uh, maybe perhaps you're all right, some of you are anyway. You've got the right color of skin or you have the right religion or whatever it is, you're okay. But there are all those people over in Asia. Africa, and they may not really be people. When you want to destroy someone, you always define them as unpeople, not really human. Monkeys may be, idiots may be, machines may be, but not people. But we have this hostility to the external world because of the superstition, the myth, the absolutely unfounded theory that you yourself exist only inside your skin. Now, I want to propose another idea altogether. You know, there are astronomers. They say there was a primordial explosion. Enormous bang, millions of years ago, billions of years ago, which flung all the galaxies into space. Well, let's take that just for the sake of argument and say that was the way it happened. It's like uh, you took a bottle of ink and you threw it at a wall. Smash, and all that ink spreads. And in the middle, it's dense, isn't it? And as it gets out on the edge, the little droplets are finer and finer and make more complicated patterns. Yeah. See? So in the same way, there was a big bang in the beginning of things and it spread. And you and I, sitting here in this room, as complicated human beings, are way, way out on the fringe of that bang. We are the complicated little patterns on the end of it. Very interesting. But so we define ourselves as being only that. If you think that you are only inside your skin, you define yourself as one very complicated little curly cue, way out on the edge of that explosion, way out in space and way out in time. Billions of years ago, you were a big bang. Now you're a complicated human being. And with them, we cut ourselves off like this and don't feel that we are still the big bang. But you are. Depends how you define yourself. You are actually, if, if this is the way things started, if there was a Big Bang in the beginning, you're not something that is a result of the Big Bang on the end of the process. You are still the process. You are the Big Bang, the original force of the universe coming on as whoever you are. See, when I meet you, I see not just what you define yourself as, Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. I see every one of you as the primordial energy of the universe coming on at me in this particular way. I know I'm that too. But we've learned to define ourselves as separate from it. And so what I would call a kind of a basic problem we've got to go through first is to understand that there are no such things as things.
that is to say separate things or separate events. That that is only a way of talking. And if you can understand this, you're going to have no further problems. <laughs> I once asked a group of high school children, what do you mean by a thing? And first of all, they gave me all sorts of synonyms. They said, it's an object, which is simply another word for a thing. It doesn't tell you anything about what you mean by a thing. And finally, a very smart girl from Italy, who was in the group, said a thing is a noun. And she was quite right. A noun isn't a part of nature, it's a part of speech. There are no nouns in the physical world. There are no separate things in the physical world either. See, the physical world is wiggly. The clouds, mountains, trees, people are all wiggly. And uh, only when human beings get working at things, they build buildings in straight lines and try and make out that the world isn't really wiggly. But here are we sitting in this room all built on straight lines, but each one of us is as wiggly as all get out. Now then, when you uh, want to get control of something that wiggles, it's pretty difficult, isn't it? You try and pick up a fish in your hands and the fish is wiggly and it slips out. What do you do to get hold of the fish? You use a net. And so the, the net is the basic thing we have for getting hold of the wiggly world. And so if you want to get hold of this wiggle, you've got to put a net over it. And I can number the holes in a net. So many so holes up, so many holes across. And if I can number these holes, I can count exactly where each wiggle is in terms of a hole in that net. And that's the beginning of calculus, the art of measuring the world. But in order to do that, I've got to break up the wiggle into bits. And I've got to call this a specific bit, and this the next bit of the wiggle, and this the next bit, and this the next bit of the wiggle. And so these bits are things or events. Bits of wiggles, which I mark out in order to talk about the wiggle, in order to measure it, and therefore in order to control it. But in nature, in fact, in the physical world, the wiggle isn't bitted. Like you don't get a cut up fryer out of an egg. <laughs> but you have to cut the chicken up in order to eat it. You bite it. But it doesn't come bitten. So the world doesn't come thinged. It doesn't come evented. You and I are all as much continuous with the physical universe as a wave is continuous with the ocean. The ocean waves and the universe peoples. And as the wave, I wave at you and say, you, the world is waving at me with you and saying, uh, hi, I'm here. But we, our consciousness, are the way we feel and sense our existence, being based on a myth that we are made, that we are parts, that we are things, our consciousness has been influenced so that each one of us does not feel that. We feel we have been hypnotized, literally hypnotized, by social convention into feeling and sensing that we exist only inside our skins. That we are not the original bang, but just something out on the end of it. And therefore we are scared stiff. Because my wave is going to disappear. And I'm going to die. And that would be awful. We've got a mythology going now, which as uh, Father Maskell put it, we are nothing but something that happens between the maternity ward and the crematorium. And that's it. And therefore, everybody feels unhappy and miserable. You know, this is what people really believe today. You may go to church, you may say you believe in this, that and the other, but you don't. Even Jehovah's Witnesses, who are the most fundamentalist fundamentalists, they are polite when they come round and knock at the door. But if you really believed in Christianity, you'd be screaming in the streets. But nobody does. You'd be taking full-page ads in the paper every day. You'd have the most terrifying television programs. The churches would be going out of their minds if they really believe what they teach. But they don't. 
they think they ought to believe what they teach. They believe they should believe, but they don't believe it, because what we really believe is the fully automatic model. And that is our basic, plausible common sense. You are a fluke. You are a separate event. And you run from the maternity ward to the crematorium, and that's it, baby. That's it. Now, why does anybody think that way? There's no reason to, because it isn't even scientific. It's just a myth. And it's invented by people who wanted to feel a certain way. They want to play a certain game. See, the game of God got, in, got embarrassing. The, the idea of God as the potter, the architect of the universe, is, is, is good. And it makes you feel that life is, after all, important. There is someone who cares. It has meaning. It has sense. And you are valuable in the eyes of the Father. But after a while, it gets embarrassing. And you realize that everything you do is being watched by God. <laughs> he knows your tiniest, inmost feelings and thoughts. And you say after a while, quit bugging me. <laughs> I don't want you around. So you become an atheist. Just to get rid of it. Then, then you feel terrible after that because you got rid of God. But that means you got rid of yourself. You're just nothing but a machine. And your idea that you're a machine is just a machine too. So if you're a smart kid, you commit suicide. <laughs> Camus said there is only really one serious philosophical question, which is whether or not to commit suicide. I think there are four or five serious philosophical <laughs> questions. The first one is, who started it? The second is, are we going to make it? The third is, where are we going to put it? The fourth is, who's going to clean up? <laughs> and the fifth, is it serious? <laughs> but, but still, uh, should you or not commit suicide? This is a good question. Why go on? And you only go on if the game is worth the candle. Now, the universe has been going on for an incredible long time. And so, really, a, a satisfactory theory of the universe has to be one that's worth betting on. That's a very, it seems to me, absolutely elementary common sense. If you make a theory of the universe which isn't worth betting on, why bother? Just commit suicide. But if you want to go on playing the game, you've got to have an optimal theory for playing the game. Otherwise, there's no point in it. But the people who coined the fully automatic theory of the universe were playing a very funny game. What they wanted to say was this, all you people who believe in religion are old ladies and wishful thinkers. You've got a big daddy up there and you want a comfort and thing, but life is rough. Life is tough and uh, success goes to the most hard-headed people. That was a very convenient theory when the European American world was colonizing the natives everywhere else. I said, we are the end product of evolution, and uh, we're tough, see. I'm a big, strong guy because I face facts, and life is just a bunch of junk, and I'm going to impose my will on it and turn it into something else, you see. And I'm real hard. See, that's a way of flattering yourself. And so uh, it has become academically plausible and fashionable that this is the way the world works. In academic circles, no other theory of the world than the fully automatic model is respectable. Because if you're an academic person, you've got to be an intellectually tough person. You've got to be prickly. See, there are basically two kinds of philosophy. One's called prickles, the other's called goo. And uh, prickly people are precise, rigorous, logical. They like everything chopped up and clear. Goo people like it vague. For example, in physics, 
prickly people believe that the ultimate constituents of matter are particles. Goo people believe it's waves. And uh, in, in uh, philosophy, prickly people are logical positivists and goo people are idealists. And they're always arguing with each other. And what they don't realize is that they, neither one can take his position without the other person. Because you wouldn't know you advocated prickles unless there was somebody else advocating goo. <laughs> you wouldn't know what a prickle was unless you knew what goo was. Because life is not either prickles or goo, it's gooey prickles and prickly goo. <laughs> and they go together, like back and front, male and female. And that's the answer to philosophy. See, I'm a philosopher, and I'm not going to argue very much, because if you don't argue with me, I don't know what I think. <laughs> so if we argue, I say thank you, because uh, going to the courtesy of your taking a different point of view, I understand what I mean, so I can't get rid of you. But however, you see, this whole idea that the universe is just nothing at all but unintelligent force playing around and not even enjoying it is a put-down theory of the world. People who had a, an advantage to make a game to play by putting it down and making out that because they put the world down, they were a superior kind of people. So uh, that just won't do. Uh, we've had it, because if, if you seriously go along with this idea of the world, you're what is technically called alienated. You feel hostile to the world. You feel that the world is a trap. It is a, a mechanism, it's electronic and neurological uh, mechanisms into which you somehow got caught. And you, poor thing, have to put up with being in a body that's falling apart and uh, that gets cancer, that gets uh, uh, the great Siberian itch, and uh, it's just terrible. And these mechanics, doctors, are trying to help you out, but they really can't succeed in the end. And you're just going to fall apart, and it's a grim business, and it's too bad. So if you think that that's the way things are, you may as well commit suicide right now. Unless you say, well, I don't. Because there really, after all, there might be eternal damnation in the back of the thing if I did that. Or uh, then I identify with my children or something, and I think of them going on and without me and uh, nobody to support them. But of course, if I do go on in this frame of mind and continue to support them, I shall merely teach them to be like I am. And they'll go on dragging it out to support their children, and they won't enjoy it and they'll be afraid to commit suicide, and so will their children. They all learn the same lesson. So you see, all I'm trying to say is that the basic common sense about the nature of the world that is influencing most people in the United States today, the fully automatic model, is simply a myth. If you want to say that the idea of God the Father with his white beard on the golden throne is a myth, in the bad sense of the word myth, so is this other one. It's just as phony and has just as little to support it as being the true state of affairs. Why? And let's get this clear. If there is any such thing at all as intelligence and love and beauty, well, you found it in other people. In other words, it exists in us as human beings. And as I said, if it is there in us, it is symptomatic of the scheme of things. We are as symptomatic of the scheme of things as the apples are symptomatic of the apple tree or the rose of the rose bush. The earth is not a big rock infested with living organisms any more than your skeleton is bones infested with cells. The earth is geological, yes, but this geological entity grows 
people. And our existence on the earth is a symptom of the solar system and its balances, as much as the solar system in turn is a symptom of our galaxy. And our galaxy in its turn is a symptom of the whole company of galaxies. Goodness only knows what that's it. But you see, when as a scientist you describe the behavior of a living organism, you try to say what a person does. It's the only way in which you can describe what a person is. Describe what they do. Then you find out that in making this description, you cannot confine yourself to what happens inside the skin. In other words, you can't talk about a person walking unless you start describing the floor. Because when I walk, I don't just dangle my legs in empty space. I move in relationship to a room. And so in order to describe what I'm doing when I'm walking, I have to describe the room. I have to describe the territory. So in, in, in de describing my talking at the moment, I can't describe this just as a thing in itself because I'm talking to you. And so what I'm doing at the moment is not completely described unless your being here is described also. So if that is necessary, if in other words, in order to describe my behavior, I have to describe your behavior and the behavior of the environment, it means that we've really got one system of behavior. That what I am involves what you are. I don't know who I am unless I know who you are. And you don't know who you are unless you know who I am. There was a wise rabbi once said, if I am I because you are you, and you are you because I am I, then I am not I and you are not you. In other words, we are not separate. We define each other. We're all backs and fronts to each other. You know, uh, you can't, for example, have two sticks. You lean two sticks against each other and they stand up because they support each other. Take one away and the other falls. They interdepend. And so in exactly that way, we and our environment and all of us and each other are interdependent systems. <coughs> we know who we are in terms of other people. We all lock together. And this is again and again the serious scientific description of how things happen and any good scientist knows therefore that what you call the external world is as much you as your own body your skin doesn't separate you from the world it's a bridge through which the external world flows into you and you flow into it. Just, for example, as a whirlpool in water, you could say, because you have a skin, you have a definite shape, you have a definite form, all right? Here is a, a flow of water, and it suddenly, it does a whirlpool. And then it goes on. The whirlpool is a definite form, but no water stays put in it. The whirlpool is something the stream is doing. And exactly the same way, the whole universe is doing each one of us. And I see you today, and I recognize you tomorrow, just as I would recognize a whirlpool in a stream. I'd say, oh yes, I've seen that whirlpool before. It's just near so-and-so's house on the edge of the river, and it's always there. So in the same way, when I meet you tomorrow, I recognize you, you're the same whirlpool you were yesterday. But you're moving. The whole world is moving through you. All the cosmic rays, all the food you're eating, the stream of steaks and milk and uh, eggs and uh, uh, everything is just flowing right through you. When you're wiggling the same way, the world is wiggling, the stream is wiggling you. But the problem is, you see, we haven't been taught to feel that way. The myths underlying our culture and underlying our common sense have not taught us to feel identical with the universe but only parts of it, only in it, only confronting it, aliens. And we are, I think, quite urgently in need of coming to feel that we are the eternal universe, each one of us.
Otherwise, we're going to go out of our heads. We're going to commit suicide, collectively, with courtesy of H-bombs. And, uh, all right, supposing we do, well, that will be that, and it will be life making experiments on other galaxies. Maybe they'll find a better game. Out of Your Mind now continues with the next lecture from the Nature of Consciousness lecture series. Well now, I was discussing two of the great myths or models of the universe which lie in the intellectual and psychological background of all of us. The myth of the world as a political, monarchical state in which we are all here on sufferance as subjects of God. in which we are made artifacts who do not exist in our own right. God alone, in the first myth, exists in his own right. And you exist as a favor. And you ought to be grateful. It's like your parents come on and say to you, maybe, look at all the things we've done for you. All the money we spent to send you to college. And uh, you turn out to be a beatnik. And you're a wretched, ungrateful child. And you're supposed to uh, say, sorry, but, um, I really am. But you're, you're definitely in the position of being on probation. So that, that idea of the royal god the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, which we inherit from the political structures of the Tigris-Euphrates cultures and from Egypt. The Pharaoh, Amenhotep IV, is probably, as Freud suggested, the original author of Moses' monotheism. And the, certainly the Jewish law code comes from Hammurabi in Chaldea. And these men lived in a culture where the pyramid and the ziggurat, the ziggurat is a Chaldean version of the pyramid, indicating somehow a hierarchy of power from the boss all the way down. And God in this first myth that we've been discussing, the ceramic myth, is the boss. And the idea of God is that the universe is governed from above. But you see, this parallels and goes hand in hand with the idea that you govern your own body. That the ego, which lies somewhere between the ears and behind the eyes in the brain, is the governor of the body. And so we can't understand an assist, a system of order, a system of life in which there isn't a governor. O oh Lord, our governor, how excellent is thy name in all the world. But supposing, on the contrary, there could be a system which doesn't have a governor. That's what we are supposed to have in this society. We are supposed to be a democracy and a republic. And we are supposed to govern ourselves. And yet, as I said, it's so funny that Americans can be politically Republican. I don't mean Republican in the party sense. And yet, religiously monarchical. It's a real strange contradiction. So what is this universe? Is it a monarchy? Is it a republic? 
Is it a mechanism or an organism? Because you see, if it's a mechanism, either it's a, a mere mechanism, as in the fully automatic model, or else it's the mechanism under the control of a driver, a mechanic. If it's not that, it's an organism. And an organism is a thing that governs itself. In your body, there is no boss. You can say, you can argue, for example, that the brain is a gadget evolved by the stomach in order to serve the stomach for the purposes of getting food. Or you can argue that the stomach is a gadget evolved by the brain to feed it and keep it alive. Whose game is this? Is it the brain's game or the stomach's game? It doesn't make, Yo. actually, they, they are mutual. The brain implies the stomach, the stomach implies the brain, and neither of them is the boss. You know that story about all the limbs of the body? Said, uh, the hands said, we, we do all our work, the feet said, we do our work mouth said we do all the chewing and he has this lazy stomach who just gets it all and doesn't do a thing he doesn't do any work so let's go on strike and the hands refuse to carry the feet refuse to walk the mouth refuse to chew and said now we're on strike against the stomach but after a while all of them found themselves getting weaker and weaker yeah. and weaker and weaker because they didn't recognize that the stomach fed them So there is the possibility then that we are not in the kind of system that are these two myths delineate, that we are not living in a world where we ourselves in the deepest sense of, our, of self are outside reality and somehow in a position that we have to bow down to it and say, as a great favor, please preserve us in existence. Nor are we in a system which is merely mechanical and in which we are nothing but flukes trapped in the electrical wiring of a nervous system which is fundamentally rather inefficiently arranged. What's the alternative? Well, we can put the alternative in another image altogether. And I will call this not the ceramic image, not the fully automatic image, but the dramatic image. Consider the world as a drama. What's the basis of all drama? The basis of all stories, of all plots, of all happenings. game of hide and seek. You get a baby, what's the fundamental first game you play with a baby? You put a book in front of your face and you peek at the baby like this. The baby starts giggling because the baby is close to the origins of life. It comes from the womb really knowing what it's all about but it can't put it into words. See, what every child psychologist really wants to know is to get a baby to talk psychological jargon and explain how it feels. <laughs> but the baby knows. You do this and this, 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 and the baby starts laughing because the baby is a recent incarnation of God. And the baby knows, therefore, that hide and seek is the basic game. See, before, uh, w when we were children, we were taught one, two, three, and A, B, C. But we weren't sat down on our mother's knees and taught the game of black and white. That's the thing that was left out of all our educations. That life is not a conflict between opposites but a polarity. The difference between a conflict and a polarity is simply, when you say about opposite things, we sometimes use the expression, these two things are the poles apart. 
you say, for example, to someone with whom you totally disagree, I'm the poles apart from this person. But your very saying that gives the show away. Poles. Poles are the opposite ends of one magnet. And if you take a magnet, there's a North Pole and a South Pole. Right, chop off the South Pole. Move it away. The piece you've got left creates a new South Pole. You never get rid of the South Pole. Things may be the poles apart, but they go together. And you can't have the one without the other. That's the basic idea of polarity. But what we are trying to imagine is the encounter of forces that come from absolutely opposed realms that have nothing in common. When we say of two personality types that they're the poles apart, we are trying to think eccentrically instead of concentrically. And so in this way, we haven't realized that life and death, black and white, good and evil, being and non-being, come from the same center. They imply each other, so that you wouldn't know the one without the other. Now, I'm not saying that that's bad. That's fun. You are playing the game that you don't know that self and other go together in just the same way as the two poles of the magnet. So that when anybody in our culture says, uh, slips into the state of consciousness where they suddenly find this to be true and they come on and say, I'm God, we say you're insane. Now, it's very difficult. You, you can very easily slip into the state of consciousness where you feel you're God. It can happen to anyone. Just in the same way as you can get the flu or uh, measles or something like that, you can slip into the state of consciousness. When you get it, it depends upon your background and your training as to how you're going to interpret it. If you've got the idea of God that comes from popular Christianity, God as the governor, the political head of the world, and you think you're God, then you say to everybody, well, you should bow down and worship me. But if you're a member of Hindu culture and you suddenly tell all your friends I'm God, instead of saying you're insane, they say, congratulations, at last you found out. Because their idea of God 